So today we have two very transformational leaders here to talk to us about models to solve some of the biggest social and environmental problems in the world. Very excited to be here at TICON, right here in the heart of innovation and possibilities. And yet, right, right in our backyard and in many parts of the world, there are so many major problems. We are in a global climate change crisis. Inequality is increasing across the world, and we need different ways of doing things. World leaders came together in last September, recognizing this crisis, and they, they ratified what are being called the Sustainable Development Goals. These are goals that are to be achieved in the next 15 years, and they're very, very ambitious. Eliminating hunger, eliminating poverty, dealing with gender parity, equal education for all, climate crisis. And yet these goals are going to be hard to achieve. They're going to need a lot of capital, over four trillion, and that's not going to come just from government and the classic philanthropy. There's going to be a need for almost three trillion of this to come from the, the private sector. And that is going to need us to do business in a different way. Business as usual won't make this happen. We will need very disruptive and different models of doing this. And that's the topic of our discussion today. With that, and we're going to do this a bit differently than a classic fireside chat, because uh, I would like for our brilliant panelists to introduce the models they're working on. So we'll just talk to them and just listen about the models and be less interactive than a fireside chat. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, my friend and colleague, Hirad Sabeti. Welcome, Hirad. Hirad's a uh, brilliant uh, visionary. He uh, helped launch the B Team, which is a group of business leaders who come together for socially conscious business, people like Mohamed Yunus, uh, Ratan Tata. He's also an advisor to CGI, he's been an advisor to the Aspen Institute, and uh, he is working on a very transformative model right now. And uh, he's a founder and convening trustee of the Fourth Sector Networks. So welcome here, at the, and um, welcome to introduce the Fourth Sector and for benefit entrepreneurship. Terrific, thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to blaze through a, a, a set of slides that will help frame what we're talking about, and hopefully this device will work. Okay, there we go. All right, so, so the backdrop, as Radhika said, is that the world is facing now the largest, most complex and urgent set of crises we've ever had to deal with. And the SDGs are basically a 15-year timeline for solving those problems. So the structure... Oh, you can't. So the structure of most economies is a three-sector architecture where business activity generates all the money that funds governments and nonprofits. Within that architecture, basically the panacea for solving problems is economic growth. It's presumed that if we grow the economy, we create jobs, we create prosperity, the products and services that, that firms generate enhance quality of life, and of course governments and, and philanthropy uh, get the resources they need to do the work that they have to do. The challenge with that is that the, the, we presume that economic growth means more and bigger for-profit firms. And for-profit firms maximize profit, which means they minimize cost, labor, raw materials. Essentially, human beings and natural resources end up being costs to be minimized. And so over time, as these costs get externalized uh, you know, to, to try to maximize the profit, we end up with lots of social and environmental problems on our hands that are escalating, like climate change, like inequality. So this pattern of problem solving at the macro scale is not working. Um, as Sally said, it's a dysfunctional equilibrium and it needs to be disrupted. So fortunately, social entrepreneurs all over the world are in fact disrupting this equilibrium. If you take all organizations on the planet and you categorize them by their purpose, they fall on this spectrum between maximizing financial benefit to their owners, which is what for-profit firms do, and maximizing social benefit, which is what nonprofits and governments do. Over the past few decades, you've had this movement of for-profit firms to the right, broadening their purpose to include social and environmental value creation. So CSR, sustainability, triple bottom line, lots and lots of trends within this larger mega trend. There's another big pattern. Um, if you look at organizations by the way they generate their income, they fall in the spectrum between those that rely on market exchange, which is what for-profits do, and those that rely on contributed income through taxes and charity. That's what governments and nonprofits do. And similarly, we've got a few decades of this transition of governments and, and nonprofit organizations towards the market. That's another mega trend. So if you take these two trends and look at them relative to each other, that top, this is not quite fitting, that's purpose along the top and income along the side. 
So in the top right space, you've got organizations that maximize financial benefit for their owners relying on earned income. That's where for-profits are concentrated in the private sector. In the bottom right, you've got organizations that maximize social benefit relying on contributed income, and that's where nonprofits and governments are. So this, you can't see the government down there, but it's below nonprofits. This is the three-sector architecture that I mentioned earlier. And we, treat, we try to grow the for-profit sector to, to, to solve all these problems, and it's not working, right? And these are the patterns of change from the last couple of slides, all the things that we celebrate about business and government and, and, and nonprofits. So these are two big trends. The other uh, really big trend over the last few decades is the emergence in this top right space of new organizational forms all over the world. Social businesses, social enterprises, sustainable businesses, common good corporations, the list goes on and on and on, and every year there's a few new ones. So this whole collective set of activity constitutes an emerging fourth sector of the economy. So we're in this organic transition that's been decades in the making, where economies are, are going from a three-sector model to a four-sector model. And as this organic transition, th this organic emergence basically starts to get formalized, governments are basically trying to figure out how to... Um, how to basically create a formal architecture around the fourth sector, the same way the second and third and first sectors have. Um, they have to first define what a four benefit is. So, uh, oh, sorry, a four benefit is basically a generic term that refers to four sector entities, all of them. The same way a, a nonprofit is a generic term that refers to third sector entities. So to get a quick idea of what, what attributes four benefits have, they all have social purpose, they have primacy of mission, the same way nonprofits do and they all earn their income, or at least a substantial portion of their income through market activity. So when you have that combination, the purpose of a nonprofit and the metabolism of a business, you're no longer a nonprofit or a for-profit, you're in this for-benefit space, you're in the fourth sector. Some, some for-benefits have other attributes, like inclusive ownership, stakeholder governance, fair compensation standards, standards for reasonable returns to their investors, social environmental responsibility, transparency, and protected assets, which is a sort of like a mission or asset lock. So combinations of those attributes you can find in different four benefits. There's not one, or there's not very many that have all of them, but imagine a long typology of four benefits uh, that, that have different combinations of those attributes. So there's a four sector emerging globally. There's also an ecosystem emerging around the four sector. So just like the other three sectors have a, a comprehensive ecosystem of policy, of capital markets, of standards that measure and report their performance, of educational training programs that, that develop their workforce, the fourth sector also has all of that emerging for it. So public policy has been shifting in a lot of different countries. Uh, they're passing new uh, legislation and, and, and regulation to support these kinds of enterprises. In the U.S., there's about 30 states that have passed this kind of legislation. Uh, financial markets are shifting, venture philanthropy, impact investment, social finance, more and more governments, funders, investors looking for ways to generate triple bottom line returns. Uh, ratings and certification standards are proliferating that distinguish these kinds of entities from others. So every aspect of the ecosystem has also been emerging. How big is this phenomenon? It's hard to see, basically, um, that's cut off down there, but it's, it's, you can't find four benefits through the lens of existing law, because just by definition, these things are pushing the boundaries of that. But you can find pockets of four benefit activity within each of the three sectors, and then there's this hybrid zone in between where you have sort of hybrid or quasi-governmental entities that are for benefits. So collectively in the US, these things account for somewhere between 5 and 15% of the GDP and account for 10 to 20% of jobs. So it's a huge sector of the economy, similar numbers in Europe, uh, and it's going to grow very rapidly because most human beings are benefit optimizers biologically, they're not profit maximizers. This is why study after study shows that human beings in various capacities as consumers, as employees, uh, as entrepreneurs, as investors, as, as, as founders, as um, uh, job seekers, they're looking for for-benefit alternatives versus for-profit ones. So growing more and more, um, there's a study that came out recent, or a few years ago that said the job growth rate in this sector is twice what it is uh, in other countries. Sorry, in <laughs> relative to the, to the for-profit sector. So why does this matter? You basically have, uh, up until now, when you're a policymaker, at the highest level, you've been trying to grow the for-profit sector because that creates jobs and, and, and enhances all the other sort of quality of life things we talked about earlier. Now you've got a, a second sector or a fourth sector of the economy alongside for-profit and for-benefits are growing jobs twice as fast. They're solving social and environmental problems because that's their mission. They, they create better quality jobs because they care more about their workers. 
They're generating, uh, they're leveraging private capital to solve these problems. So they're reducing the burdens on government and the costs on government. Um, and they generate new resources for government and philanthropy. So as we think about economic policy and development and entrepreneurship ecosystems, the four benefits sector or the four sectors taking more and more uh, of, uh, is becoming more and more important. Lots of people talking about this, not just me. Uh, I'll leave you guys with this last quote from Pope Benedict. Basically says that the, um, well, you can't see the top part, but the, this space the, the, between profit-based companies and nonprofit organizations no longer does, that distinction no longer does full justice to reality. Uh, in recent years, a broad intermediate area has emerged between the two types of enterprise. It is to be hoped that these new kinds of enterprise will succeed in finding a suitable juridical and fiscal structure in every country. This basically means over the next few years, we're gonna see most countries adopt a formal four-sector architecture and, and for-benefit entrepreneurship is gonna be the rage. So, thank you. Thank you, Hirad. So we just heard about how the institution of business is being transformed. Now I'd like to invite our second speaker, um, Premal Shah, to talk about how the institution of finance and credit is being um, revolutionized and transformed to help solve social problems. Premal doesn't need an introduction. He's a founder and CEO of Kiva, which has transformed the lives of so many people around the world. And um, I believe uh, what, over 800 uh, million in loans. Yeah, I got the number right. Yeah. And so, Welcome, and also the other thing I want to mention is that Kiva is an example of a for benefit that Hira just talked with us about. It is probably one of the most successful for benefits out there. And not only are they for benefit, they are a key player in the ecosystem for for benefits, funding for benefits. So it's, it's just a thrill to have you both here together and uh, welcome you to tell us a bit about Kiva and how you see the, the for benefit ecosystem evolve. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone. How many of you uh, have been to the Kiva website? You know what it is? Okay, so um, uh, there's a few folks. Uh, we have a screenshot uh, right now of the site, which I think is going to be put up any time here. Uh, and what it is, is it's a crowdfunding website um, whose mission is to connect people through lending to alleviate poverty. And I want to do three things with the time that I have. One is just tell you a little bit about my personal journey since there's many young people here and I assume the reason why you're here is you're thinking about your own career paths and how you can actually have a career of purpose. Um, two, I want to address what Herod was talking about. This concept of the fourth sector or blending profit and purpose, these four benefit corporations, it has such, it could be such a powerful lever to right so many of the wrongs that were generally created in the 20th century, now in the 21st century. We could do that, that's our opportunity. That could be our generational legacy to really, really change a lot of the trend lines here. And I wanna talk about one of the things that I see missing in the sector. Wow, I only have two minutes left, amazing. Um, <laughs> well, let me just fast forward here. Look, here's the site. Right now you can go onto the site and crowdfund in $25 increments. Um, a loan to this group of women in Tamil Nadu. And um, together, when you and a number of other people on the internet have fully funded that loan, we work with a local NGO that provides not only the loans, but also um, business training and education to, to, the, to uh, this group of women uh, to disperse and administer your loan and collect the repayments. As you get repaid, you can recycle it. And it's a 0% interest lending system where you get your return of principal but you don't make a return. So what's primary is the benefit. What's secondary, obviously, is a return. It's an underperforming investment, but overperforming donation. And of the $800 million that has been raised through the Kiva website, there's been a 96% repayment rate. Um, and that's helped 1.3 million microenterprises, three out of four of which are women-run microenterprises in 80 countries. Let me talk about the gap that I see today. In, uh, when it comes to four benefit organizations, particularly those that work with the base of the pyramid in the, in the developing world context. We need more patient capital. How many of you here are looking for money? How many of you here, keep your hand up if you're looking for money and what you're doing is working in, uh, in a part of the market where more patience is needed on, on the part of the investors? Let me give you uh, two examples. We were just, the previous panel was on farming. Um, you know, if this room were the country of Kenya, everyone from here to here would be rural subsistence farmers. And uh, f 
you know, one organization that we support uh, that is a for benefit is called Honey Care Africa. They provide um, farmers with beehives, and beehives can be a real, real double win. One, uh, it can help the farmer that while they're growing, you know, crops over here, they can now uh, sell honey, right? Um, and two, these bees that they have on their land can cross-pollinate with their crops and get better yields for the farmer. So this is a great idea, but in, in concept. But when they went in as a, as a, as a, as a social enterprise and they were going to split the honey revenues with the farmers, with the subsistence farmers 50-50, it actually, you looked at the beehives and there was no, the farmers were not taking care of the, of, the, um, of the actual hives. There were no bees in them. And there were weeds growing all over it. What was going on? Well, it turns out like you and me, the farmers in Kenya were afraid of bees. <laughs> right? So this, this concept of, hey, we're going to start a for-profit business and we're going to really work with the base of the pyramid with farmers and it's going to all work out. No, it's actually quite difficult. So now this organization, Honey Care Africa, has to add new costs to their model of creating local honey collectors with the, you know, the beekeeping outfits and the whole thing, right? This, this happens time and again where the, 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 um, there's more time needed oftentimes for market education for kind of more, call it adaptation and pivots to the model. And their investors, Honeycare Africa, really needs to be patient with their rate of return requirements, I think, to create something that could be very promising for subsistence farmers. Let me give a second example because I think it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Also in the same context, dryland farmers are amongst the most poor people on the planet because it's, trying to, it's like trying to grow something in a sandbox, right? Like how would you, how would you actually um, you know, make money on crops when it's so, your land fertility is so low? Well, there's a great organization called Kamaza, also a for-profit social benefit company. And they work with farmers to plant 200 trees that can actually find the water deep down in the land. And each tree, after seven to 10 years, if it makes it, if they can grow and harvest it, they can sell each tree for about $30 to $100 per tree, and they do a 50-50 revenue share with the farmers. These are the farmers that they work with, these dry land farmers in Kenya, earn every day 14 cents. That's 14 cents purchasing power parity. It's, you know, trying to make a live, you try, to, try to feed your family in 14 cents, it's, it's hard. The only other NGO working there right now is the World Food Program with direct distribution of, 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 of grains and food aid. And this organization now is six years in. They have not yet harvested a tree. They have 1.5 million trees in the ground with 7,000 farm families. And the challenge is that they can't yet get the venture capitalists and banks to actually really want to invest in the model because there's not enough data on whether or not these trees will actually be able to be harvested and sold. There still could be drought. There could be side selling from the farmer. There could be pests. So many things could go wrong. But if it goes well, this program could basically bring these very, very poor farmers into the middle class. There's so many examples of frontline social enterprises that are using business and the methods of business and the discipline of business to really um, really create new income streams, new, uh, new well-being, levers for well-being for, for those who have the least. And what we need is more patient capital, amongst other things. But I wanted to call that out. And um, Kiva, what we're trying to do on our website is allow you to be a patient capitalist towards these models on the front lines of poverty. Thank you, Premal, for that very inspiring talk. I also want to mention that there are several young for-benefit entrepreneurs with us here visiting from India, especially Rajiv Circle Fellows. Sanwar, if you would stand up for a second. Sanwar Oberoi, who himself is an awesome for-benefit entrepreneur, and uh, he is leading a group of 12 um, young for-benefit entrepreneurs from India and Pakistan, all staying in one house as a family, and uh, he can connect you with them if you'd like to meet them. This is a big change happening in the world right now. So thank you again, I want to thank our speakers. And for, for me, I grew up in the world of the Gandhi Ashram, in the backdrop of the Gandhi Ashram, very inspired by Gandhian philosophy. And to me, for benefit entrepreneurship brings that spirit of having sustainable ways of solving social problems and fighting for the dignity of all to the forefront and is a very scalable model. So I invite all of you for us to collectively come together and leverage the power of for benefit entrepreneurship to, to fight for a world and a world that is much, much more equality and climate justice and where the dignity of all is respected and uses as a powerful tool to make that happen. Thank you.
so many. <laughs> it's so brutal. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, uh, for example, I went to India. I was working at PayPal, and they let me go on sabbatical because I had been there for five years, and I was complaining a lot. And they're like, all right, just go, just go. So I wanted to volunteer in India, and I volunteered at the Gandhi Ashram at an incredible organization there called Gramshri. It was a women's collective. And by day, I was trying to help them list their items up on eBay because that way it would create more income for these women who are... We don't have time to go into the full story, but so many... I think here's the... If I had to bottom line a few lessons, one is nothing works unless you do. Two is... Um, two is, you know, on, honestly keep your costs low. Don't quit your day job and see if you can try to develop your model if you're committed to starting a social enterprise because, frankly, PayPal financed a lot of me going and, you know, trying to help, you know, with a small group of people get this internet crowdfunding model going. So, you know, try to figure out a way to keep your costs low or some kind of revenue going while you take time on nights and weekends to really learn, let the work teach you. Um, and, you know, while you want to be clear on the vision, you want to be adaptable. And then the the third thing I would say is, you know, in my case, the specific thing I was working on got taken down because it violated eBay's legal policies I was trying to do on the eBay w website. Don't be afraid to be the first follower of someone else. So I joined Matt and Jessica Flannery because they actually had a website that was actually working, the Kiva early prototype, instead of trying to say, well, I want to do it and I want to be the leader, so on and so forth. So let's also not just celebrate the social entrepreneur, but really, let's celebrate the group of first followers, the first people who come in and help support a model. That's what makes ideas uh, you know, turn, you know, t turn into real, um, real things that have traction. And so um, find people that are doing things that you really love and ask how you can be helpful. And one thing I would say just to the young people here, this is a kind of an irresponsible comment perhaps, <laughs> the notion that you'd pay money to go to m master's programs and get degrees and certificates as opposed to just working for free at a company that you think is going to change the world, right? I mean, one, you're going into debt to get a degree for something. <laughs> Makes no sense to learn academically about these other companies when you could go work at that other company for free and learn on the job and maybe get hired or at least have that much more context. Don't let, you know, kind of these traditional paths cloud what you think is going to be the best way to put your gifts to best use in your life. All right.